Something powerful happens when a child of God seeks to know more about Him and His beloved Son. Nowhere are those truths taught more clearly and powerfully than in the Book of Mormon. God always provides safety for the soul. And with the Book of Mormon, He has again done that in our time. Remember this declaration by Jesus Himself. Whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. And in the last days, neither your heart nor your faith will fail you. The Second Book of Nephi An account of the death of Lehi. Nephi's brethren rebel against him. The Lord warns Nephi to depart into the wilderness, his journeyings in the wilderness, and so forth. Chapter 1 Lehi prophesies of a land of liberty. His seed will be scattered and smitten if they reject the Holy One of Israel. He exhorts his sons to put on the armor of righteousness, about 588 to 570 B.C. And it came to pass that after I, Nephi, had made an end of teaching my brethren, our father Lehi also spake many things unto them, and rehearsed unto them how great things the Lord had done for them in bringing them out of the land of Jerusalem. And he spake unto them concerning their rebellions upon the waters, and the mercies of God in sparing their lives, that they were not swallowed up in the sea. And he also spake unto them concerning the land of promise, which they had obtained, how merciful the Lord had been in warning us that we should flee out of the land of Jerusalem. For behold, said he, I have seen a vision in which I know that Jerusalem is destroyed, and had we remained in Jerusalem, we should also have perished. But said he, notwithstanding our afflictions, we have obtained a land of promise, a land which is choice above all other lands, a land a land which the Lord God hath covenanted with me should be a land for our inheritance of my seed. Yea, the Lord hath covenanted this land unto me and to my children forever, and also all those who should be led out of other countries by the hand of the Lord. So Nephi is trying to reiterate to his brothers, look at all the blessings the Lord has given us. Look at the direction that he has brought us and the miracles that we've had and the destruction that we've been able to avoid by following the Lord's counsel and what the Lord tells us to do. They had just, they left Jerusalem. Remember, they went back a few times and it wasn't destroyed. And so Laman, Laman and Lemuel had a hard time because they were like, Dad told us it's going to be destroyed. He claimed he's a prophet. And we went back and it's fine. We went back to Laban to get the plates and our stuff was still there. We went back to our house to get our stuff to take to Laban to basically trade for the plates. And our house was fine. Everything was fine. Jerusalem was fine. So then Nephi is commanded to build a ship. He's ridiculed by his brothers. He builds it anyway. They go across the waters to the promised land. And now Nephi is telling them because his brothers are still upset. And they actually, they actually were listening to him. And so he started to quote Isaiah because he wanted them to know the prophecies that Isaiah had foretold. And now he's basically saying, you guys, please remember all the things that the Lord has done for us, all the ways he's led us out of what could have been captivity. The Babylonians came and invaded Jerusalem and conquered King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nephi is trying to say, guys, look at all these things the Lord has done for us. He's pleading with them to remember what the Lord has done. And he also tells them, Jerusalem is now destroyed. I've seen it in a vision, and it's been destroyed. So, you know, let go of that dream. Stop thinking that Dad was wrong to lead us out. Jerusalem is gone. Wherefore, I, Lehi, prophesy according to the workings of the Spirit which is in me, that there should none come into this land, save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore, this land is consecrated unto him whom he shall bring. And if it so be that they shall serve him according to the commandments which he hath given, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. Wherefore, they shall never be brought down into captivity. If so, it shall be because of iniquity. For if iniquity shall abound, cursed shall be the land for their sakes. But unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. So Nephi is telling us here where they landed, this promised land will be a land of liberty. And he says the only way that we will lose our liberty is by iniquity. iniquity. Iniquity is sin. Iniquity is turning away from the Lord. 
For if iniquity shall abound, cursed shall be the land for their sakes. Where are we at in our country right now? We have allowed sin to run rampant. And this is what's happening. We are losing our liberties right now because we are no longer worshiping our Lord and Savior how we should. And based off the morals and the principles that this country was founded upon that led our founding fathers and all of the incredible people that were guided by thee to establish this land of liberty. We are losing our liberties right now. And behold, it is wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. For behold, many nations would overrun the land, that there would be no place for an inheritance. Interesting. Wherefore I, Lehi, have obtained a promise that inasmuch as those whom the Lord God shall bring out of the land of Jerusalem shall keep his commandments, they shall prosper upon the face of this land, and they shall be kept from all other nations, that they may possess this land unto themselves. And if it so be that they shall keep his commandments, they shall be blessed upon the face of the land, and there shall be none to molest them, nor to take away the land of their inheritance, and they shall dwell safely forever. But behold, when the time cometh that they shall dwindle in unbelief, after they have received so great blessings from the hand of the Lord, having a knowledge of the creation of the earth, and all men knowing the great and marvelous works of the Lord from the creation of the world, having power given them to do all things by faith, having all the commandments from the beginning, and having been brought by his infinite goodness into this precious land of promise. Behold, I say, if the day shall come, that they will reject the Holy One of Israel, the true Messiah, their Redeemer, and their God. Behold, the judgments of him that is just shall rest upon them. There's a lot in that verse that we just read. Basically, when we stop worshiping our Savior, we are under condemnation. And if we forget, it says, we are brought by the infinite goodness into this precious land of promise. And when we reject the Holy Messiah, our Redeemer and our God, the judgments of him that is just will rest upon us. That's where we're at right now. And that's why it is more important than ever that we are standing up for God and that we know him and we know his voice and we know how the Holy Ghost talks to us and how Heavenly Father guides our lives. Yea, he will bring another Yea, he will bring other nations unto them, and he will give unto them power, that he will take away from them the lands of their possessions, and he will cause them to be scattered and smitten. Yea, as one generation passeth to another, there shall be bloodsheds and great visitations among them. Wherefore, my sons, I would that you would remember, yea, I would that you would hearken unto my words. I think the word remember is so important, because every single thing that we are learning in this book, everything that we know about the pre-existence, where we were before we came here, the plan of salvation, and even the war in heaven, which was the war wherein we chose to follow the Savior. We know that because we're here. Every single person on this earth chose Jesus Christ's plan, in which he promised his dad, our Heavenly Father, that he would come to the earth and condescend to our level to even be here and have these mortal experiences and live a life of perfection and purity and travel the country no and spend his his days and his life in service in healing in guiding in preaching repentance in preaching faith our Savior did that for us, and Heavenly Father allowed Jesus to be crucified. And these are all things that we know because we knew them before. And so every time in the Book of Mormon when it says, remember, it's really important. That's what we need to do is remember. Remember the times when the Holy Ghost has touched our hearts, when we felt answers, when we felt clarity, when we felt peace. He wants us to remember those times. Remember our covenants. Remember 
the Holy Ghost, what that feels like. Remember the wisdom and the knowledge that we knew. Remember. So Lehi is talking right now and he is saying, please remember, my sons, you have to remember this. And he's also the one telling us all about this land of liberty and this land that that we are only protected when we are worshiping and remembering the true Messiah, our Redeemer, and our God. And Lehi is just pleading with Lehi. Lehi is pleading with his sons and with all of us to remember. Remember what we have been taught, what we know, and what the Lord needs us to remember. Oh, that you would awake, awake from a deep sleep, yea, even from the sleep of hell, and shake off the awful chains by which ye are bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men, that they are carried away captive down to the eternal gulf of misery and woe. Any time we're told to awake, I think it's really important. I think we need to wake up right now to our awful situation and also awake to our understanding of what is happening. Read the scriptures and the Lord will give you clarity to line up our current day events to scripture. Fulfillment of prophecy all around us, everything that's happening. Awake and arise from the dust and hear the words of a trembling parent whose limbs you must soon lay down in the cold and silent grave from whence no traveler can return. A few more days and I go the way of all the earth. This is literally Lehi's pleadings to his sons. Please wake up and please hear me. Please, like he said before, with all the feeling of a tender parent, this is what he's saying the words of a trembling parent whose limbs you must soon lay down in the cold, silent grave. He's like, you guys, I'm not going to live very long. Please hear me. Please, please obey what I'm saying. Please listen to the Lord. Obey the Lord. And he is telling them, I will die in a few days. You'll bury me in this ground in a few days. And I'm pleading with you to remember the great things that the Lord has told us. But behold, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory, and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. And I desire that ye should remember to observe the statutes and the judgments of the Lord. Behold, this hath been the anxiety of my soul from the beginning. My heart hath been weighed down with sorrow from time to time, for I have feared lest for the hardness of your hearts the Lord your God should come out in the fullness of his wrath upon you, that ye be cut off and destroyed forever." or that a cursing should come upon you for the space of many generations, and ye are visited by sword and by famine and are hated, and are led according to the will and captivity of the devil. O oh, my sons, that these things might not come upon you, but that ye might be a choice and a favored people of the Lord. But behold, his will be done, for his ways are righteousness forever. And he hath said that inasmuch ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land." But inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence. And now that my soul might have joy in you, and that my heart might leave this world with gladness because of you, that I might not be brought down with grief and sorrow to the grave, arise from the dust, my sons, and be men. That line is one of my favorite lines in the whole scriptures. Arise from the dust, my sons, and be men. This is what the Lord needs us to do. He needs us to rise up to fulfill the measure of our creation. Men need to be men. Women need to be women. And be determined in one mind and in one heart, united in all things, that ye may not come down into captivity. That ye may not be cursed with a sore cursing, and also that ye may not incur the displeasure of a just God upon you, unto the destruction, yea, the eternal destruction of both soul and body. Awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness, shake off the chains from which ye are bound, and come forth out of obscurity and arise from the dust. Rebel no more against your brother, whose views have been glorious, and who have kept the commandments from the time that we left Jerusalem, and who have been an instrument in the hands of God in bringing us forth into the land of promise. For were it not for him, we must have perished with hunger in the wilderness, Nevertheless, ye sought to take away his life. Yea, and he hath suffered much sorrow because of you. 
and I exceedingly fear and tremble because of you, lest he should suffer again. For behold, ye have accused him that he sought power and authority over you. But I know that he hath not sought for power nor authority over you, but he hath sought the glory of God and your own eternal welfare. And ye have murmured because he hath been plain unto you. Ye say that he hath used sharpness, and ye say that he hath been angry with you. But behold, his sharpness was the sharpness of the power of the word of God, which was in him. And that which he called anger was the truth, according to that which is in God, which he could not restrain manifesting boldly concerning your iniquities. So Lehi is saying, you're mad at Nephi. You thought he was talking mean to you or sharp to you, but all he was saying was the word of God. And he's saying that's what the word of God feels like, especially when we need to be corrected. It is sharp and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, the scriptures tell us. And this is exactly what Lehi is telling his sons. You're mad at Nephi because he's preaching to you what the Lord is telling him to say. And you think he's being mean. We have to be careful that we don't let our emotions overshadow truth and facts, especially when we're being called to repentance. Because we all, every single one of us, need to be called to repentance in this life. That's what we're supposed to do. We're, we are supposed to repent and turn back to the Lord and obey and have peace and promise and prosperity. And prosperity, our current day definition of prosperity is not the scripture's definition. I would argue it has nothing to do with money. I think it has everything to do with having your needs met, having peace and hope and direction and guidance and and love in your life that's been my experience with prosperity and i know that that is a blessing that comes with keeping our covenants and obeying and it must needs be that the power of god must be with him even unto his commanding you that ye must obey but behold it was not he but it was the spirit of the lord which was in him which opened his mouth to utterance that he could not shut it and now my son, Laman, and also Lemuel and Sam, and also my sons who are the sons of Ishmael. Behold, if you will hearken unto the voice of Nephi, ye shall not perish. And if you will hearken unto him, I leave unto you a blessing, yea, even my first blessing. But if you will not hearken unto him, I take away my first blessing, yea, even my blessing, and it shall rest upon him. And now, Zoram, I speak unto you. Behold, thou art the servant of Laban. Nevertheless, thou hast been brought out of the land of Jerusalem, and I know that thou art a true friend unto my son Nephi forever. So if we remember Zoram, Zoram was Laban's servant. And, you know, it took three attempts for Nephi and his brothers to get the plates from Laban. But something was different about the third that the other two didn't even offer as an option is Zoram. So maybe it took three attempts to get the plates because the Lord needed Zoram. Lehi tells us here that Zoram is a true friend to Nephi forever. So sometimes we don't understand why the Lord has his ways of doing things. And if we don't have the spirit of revelation and we don't go to the Lord for the answers, it can seem like failures. It can seem like why did it take three times? Why did the Lord tell me to do something and then put up a wall and it was too hard? We, he puts up walls because he needs us to do it his way, not our way. Wherefore, because thou hast been faithful, thy seed shall be blessed with his seed, that they dwell in prosperity long enough upon the face of the land, and nothing, save it shall be iniquity among them, shall harm or disturb their prosperity upon the face of the land forever. Wherefore, if ye shall keep the commandments of the Lord, the Lord hath consecrated this land for the security of thy seed with the seed of my son. Chapter 2. Now this is written to Jacob. Lehi's writing this to Jacob. And remember, he's on his deathbed. He's saying, I have a few days left. I'm pleading with my boys, with my children to please be obedient and please do what the Lord wants you to do. And this is what he said. Redemption comes through the Holy Messiah. Freedom of choice, agency, is essential to existence and progression. Adam fell that men might be. Men are free to choose liberty and eternal life. About 588 to 570 BC. 
So Lehi here is speaking to Jacob. Jacob is one of the new babies. Now he's a little older, but he's a young boy that was born in the wilderness. Joseph and Jacob were two new babies that Lehi and Sarai had. And so Lehi has done everything he can to plead with his older boys to be obedient to the Lord. And now he's talking to Jacob. And now, Jacob, I speak unto you. Thou art my firstborn in the days of my tribulation in the wilderness. And behold, in thy childhood thou hast suffered afflictions and much sorrow because of the rudeness of thy brethren. So he's like, I know life has been hard for you because you've seen so much fighting and you've seen your brothers just be awful. Nevertheless, Jacob, my firstborn in the wilderness, thou knowest the greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain. Wherefore, thy soul shall be blessed, and thou shalt dwell safely with thy brother Nephi, and thy days shall be spent in the service of thy God. Wherefore, I know that thou art redeemed because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer, for thou hast beheld that in the fullness of time he cometh to bring salvation unto men. And thou hast beheld in thy youth his glory. Wherefore, thou art blessed even as they unto whom he shall minister in the flesh. For the Spirit is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared from the fall of man, and salvation is free. And men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil. And the law is given unto men. And by the law no flesh is justified, or by the law men are cut off. Yea, by the temporal law they were cut off, and also by the spiritual law they perish from that which is good, and become miserable forever. So he's saying the only way to have peace and joy is by following the law of God. Wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin, to answer the ends of the law, unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. Lehi is trying to tell Jacob, this is the most important thing that the world could know is about the Savior and what he's done for us. Wherefore, he is the first fruits unto God, inasmuch as he shall make intercession for all the children of men, that they believe in him shall be saved. And because of the intercession for all, all men come unto God. Wherefore, they stand in the presence of him to be judged of him according to the truth and holiness which is in him. Wherefore, the ends of the law which the Holy One hath given, unto the inflicting of the punishment which is affixed, which punishment that is affixed is in opposition to that of the happiness which is affixed, to answer the ends of the atonement. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness, nor misery, neither good nor bad, Wherefore, all things must needs be a compound in one. Wherefore, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption, nor incorruption, happiness, nor misery, neither sense, nor insensibility. So Lehi is saying right now that we have to have sorrow to have joy. And there's opposition in all things. And he's talking about the fall. He's talking about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And at that time, they were not able to know joy and sorrow. They were not able to progress. Wherefore, it must needs have been created for a thing of naught. Wherefore, there would have been no purpose in the end of its creation. Wherefore, the thing must needs destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes, and also the power and the mercy and the justice of God. And if ye shall say there is no law... You shall also say there is no sin. If you shall say there is no sin, you shall also say there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And if there be no righteousness nor happiness, there be no punishment nor misery. And if these things are not, there is no God. And if there is no God, we are not. 
neither the earth, for there could have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. Wherefore, all things must have vanished away. And now, my sons, I speak unto you these things for your profit and learning. For there is a God, and he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are, both things to act and things to be acted upon, and to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man. After he had created our first parents, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and in fine all things which are created, it must needs be that there was an opposition, even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter. Wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. He gave that to us. That is agency. Our agency is what allows us to choose to follow our Savior and to be obedient to his commandments. And our agency is one of the greatest gifts that we have from God. Lehi tells us right here, The Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. Wherefore man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. And I, Lehi, according to the things which I have read, must needs suppose that an angel of God, according to that which is written, had fallen from heaven. Wherefore he became a devil, having sought that which was evil before God. And because he had fallen from heaven and had become miserable forever, he sought also the misery of all mankind. Wherefore he said unto Eve, Yea, even that old serpent, who is the devil, who is the father of all lies. Wherefore he said, Partake of the forbidden fruit, and ye shall not die, but ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And after Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit, they were driven out of the garden of Eden to till the earth. And they have brought forth children, yea, even the family of all the earth. And the days of the children of men were prolonged, according to the will of God, that they might repent while in the flesh. Wherefore their state became a state of probation, and their time was lengthened, according to the commandments which the Lord God gave unto the children of men. For he gave commandment that all men must repent. For he showed unto all men that they were lost because of the transgression of their parents. So he's telling us, it is such a compassionate gift of Heavenly Father that we even have the ability to repent. And we only have that because of Jesus Christ and because of his atonement that he suffered for us, that we do have the gift of repentance. And now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were in after they were created. And they must have remained forever and had no end. So no progression is what he's telling us. That we would have no chance to progress had Adam and Eve not partaken of the fruit. And they would have had no children. Wherefore, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy. For they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell that men might be. And men are that they might have joy. That's worth reading again. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Do you know that we are supposed to have joy? We're supposed to have happiness and peace in this life? Lehi tells us right here, it's part of the fall. Adam fell so that we could be here, so we could be created. And we're meant to have joy. So if we don't feel joy in our lives, we got to change things up because we know where joy comes from. The more we focus on our Savior, the more we focus on other people and on service, the more joy we feel. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon. That's an important one, I think, especially as a parent. I always try to teach my kids, you are in charge of your own actions. It doesn't matter what somebody did to you or said to you or it doesn't matter. You are responsible for your own choices. You are not somebody to be acted upon. You are somebody who is sent here to act. Save it be by the punishment of the law at the great and last day according to the commandments which God hath given. Wherefore men are free according to the flesh and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life 
through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. In the case of the devil, misery truly does love company. Every choice that Satan tempts us to do leads to misery. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's right away. Sometimes it takes time. But I promise you the end road of everything that Satan wants us to do, which would be the opposite of what Heavenly Father wants us to do, always leads to misery. He wants us to be miserable like unto himself. And now, my sons, I would that ye should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit and not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh and the evil which is therein, which giveth the spirit of the devil power to captivate, to bring you down to hell, that he may reign over you in his own kingdom. I have spoken these few words unto you all, my sons, in the last days of my probation, and I have chosen the good part. I have that marked. I love that line so much. I have chosen the good part. What a great way to sum up your life. Lehi's at the end of his life. He's on his deathbed, and he's talking, he's talking to his son, and he's telling him, these are all the things I need you to know at the end of my life. And he says, I have chosen the good part. We need to choose the good part too. I have chosen the good part according to the words of the prophet, and I have none other object save it be the everlasting welfare of your souls. Amen. Chapter 3 Joseph in Egypt saw the Nephites in vision. He prophesied of Joseph Smith, the Latter-day Seer, of Moses, who would deliver Israel, and of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, about 588 to 570 BC. So Lehi is speaking here to his second son in the wilderness that was born in the wilderness, Joseph. And now I speak unto you, Joseph, my last born. Thou wast born in the wilderness of mine afflictions, yea, in the days of my greatest sorrow did thy mother bear thee. And may the Lord consecrate also unto thee this land, which is a most precious land, for thine inheritance and the inheritance of thy seed with thy brethren, for thy security forever, if it so be that ye shall keep the commandments of the Holy One of Israel. And now, Joseph, my last born, whom I have brought out of the wilderness of mine afflictions, may the Lord bless thee forever. For thy seed shall not utterly be destroyed. For behold, thou art the fruit of my loins, and I am a descendant of Joseph, who was carried captive into Egypt. And great were the covenants of the Lord which he made unto Joseph. Wherefore, Joseph truly saw our day, and he obtained a promise of the Lord, that out of the fruit of his loins the Lord God would raise up a righteous branch unto the house of Israel, not the Messiah, but a branch which was to be broken off, Nevertheless, to be remembered in the covenants of the Lord that the Messiah should be made manifest unto them in the latter days, in the spirit of power, unto the bringing of them out of darkness unto light, yea, out of hidden darkness and out of captivity unto freedom. For Joseph truly testified, saying, A seer shall the Lord my God raise up, who shall be a choice seer unto the fruit of my loins. Yea, Joseph truly said, Thus saith the Lord unto me, A choice seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins, and he shall be esteemed highly among the fruit of thy loins. And unto him will I give commandment, that he shall do a work for the fruit of thy loins, his brethren, which shall be a great work unto them, even to the bringing of them to the knowledge of the covenants which I have made with thy fathers. So back to the intro, Joseph in Egypt saw the Nephites in vision, and then... He prophesied of Joseph Smith, the Latter-day Seer. He also prophesied of Moses. Moses and Joseph Smith have a lot of parallels with what they did as prophets on the earth to save people and bring us out of captivity, really. And I will give unto him a commandment that he shall do none other work, save the work which I shall command him. And I will make him great in mine eyes, for he shall do my work. And he shall be great like unto Moses, whom I have said I would raise up unto you to deliver my people, O house of Israel. So he says, he's commanding him to do no other work except, which, except that which the Lord commands him to do. 
right now we have so much going on this earth right now and time is quickening which is a last day's prophecy also that time will go faster but it's going faster and that means our lives are busier and satan is trying so hard to distract us and to make us feel like we are too busy for the things that really matter for our scriptures for prayer for meditation if we put the lord first then we'll be able to get done everything that he needs us to get done and if we don't get to other things and they just fall out of our lives then that's a message too from the lord that we didn't need to be doing those things or focused on those things so he's saying right here do nothing except the work which i shall command you to do in verse 8 and i will make him great in mine eyes for he shall do my work and he shall be great like unto Moses, whom I have said I would raise up unto you to deliver my people, O house of Israel. So Moses also delivered his people. And that's what I was saying. Joseph Smith did the same thing to restore the gospel on the earth. Christ's literal church back on the earth. And he delivered us and gave us the Book of Mormon, which you're here for a reason. And I'm doing this for a reason. So this is... The most important work that we could do right now is study the scriptures because they testify of our Savior and bring us closer to him. And he shall be great like unto Moses. And Moses will I raise up to deliver thy people out of the hand of Egypt. But a seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins. And unto him will I give power to bring forth my word unto the seed of thy loins. And not to the bringing forth of my word only, saith the Lord, but to the convincing them of my word which shall have already gone forth among them. So the Lord's saying, not only is he going to share my word, but he's also here to convince the people, the Gentiles, of Christ's words. Wherefore, the fruit of thy loins shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write. So that's the Bible. And that which shall be written by the fruit of thy loins, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah, shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins and bringing them to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter days and also to the knowledge of my covenant, saith the Lord. And out of weakness he shall be made strong in that day when my work shall commence among all my people unto the restoring thee, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. And thus prophesied Joseph, saying, Behold, that seer will the Lord bless, and they that seek to destroy him shall be confounded. For this promise, which I have obtained of the Lord, of the fruit of my loins, shall be fulfilled. Behold, I am sure of the fulfilling of this promise. And his name shall be called after me, and it shall be after the name of his father. And he shall be like unto me, for the thing which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand, by the power of the Lord, shall bring my people unto salvation." Yea, thus prophesied Joseph, I am sure of this thing, even as I am sure of the promise of Moses. For the Lord hath said unto me, I will preserve thy seed forever. And the Lord hath said, I will raise up a Moses, and I will give power unto him in a rod, and I will give judgment unto him in writing. Yet I will not loose his tongue, and he shall speak much, for I will not make him mighty in speaking, but I will write unto him my law by the finger of mine own hand, and I will make a spokesman for him. So he's talking about Moses. And it's pretty well known that Moses was not a great orator, not a great speaker. But the Lord gave him Aaron. And Aaron was a great speaker. And Moses, Moses could write everything the Lord told him to write. And Aaron could be a spokesman for him. I love that the Lord allows us to lean on each other like that. Instead of saying, Moses, I'm going to give you every gift so that you never need to rely on anybody. He says, Moses, I'm going to tell you things I need you to say. And I'm not going to really give you a gift to be a great speaker. <laughs> but I'm going to give you Aaron. And if you rely on Aaron and allow him to speak as a spokesman for you and you write, then you do your roles, he'll do his roles, and it's going to work perfectly like a puzzle. Just like the Lord has us rely on each other to do things too. And the Lord said unto me also, I will raise up unto the fruit of thy loins, and I will make for him a spokesman. 
And I, behold, I will give unto him that he shall write the writing of the fruit of thy loins, unto the fruit of thy loins, and the spokesman of thy loins shall declare it. And the words which he shall write shall be the words which are expedient in my wisdom that should go forth unto the fruit of thy loins. So he's like, what Moses is going to say is what I need him to say for you and for your children. And it shall be as if the fruit of thy loins had cried unto them from the dust, for I know their faith. And they shall cry from the dust, yea, even repentance unto their brethren, even after many generations have gone by them. And it shall come to pass that their cry shall go, even according to the simpleness of their words. Because of their faith, their words shall proceed forth out of my mouth unto their brethren, who are the fruit of thy loins. And the weakness of their words will I make strong in their faith, unto the remembering of my covenant which I made unto thy fathers. And now, behold, my son Joseph, after this manner did my father of old prophesy. Wherefore, because of his covenant thou art blessed, for thy seed shall not be destroyed, for they shall hearken unto the words of the book. And there shall rise up one mighty among them who shall do much good, both in word and in deed, being an instrument in the hands of God, with exceeding faith, to work mighty wonders, and to do the thing which is great in the sight of God, unto the bringing to pass much restoration unto the house of Israel, and unto the seed of thy brethren. And now, blessed art thou, Joseph, behold, thou art little, Wherefore, hearken unto the words of thy brother. When he says, Thou art little, I wonder how young he was. We know they were born in the wilderness, and it hasn't been that long. I just think that's so endearing, how Lehi is talking to his son. I think that as parents, sometimes, we think our kids don't, don't get it or don't understand things. But I want to challenge you to build up your kids and know that they are sent here and they're prepared to handle this stuff. They came to this earth equipped with the ability to hear things like this, to hear the scriptures, to hear these word for word and have the Spirit testify to them of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. They came armed with the gifts and abilities and powers that the Lord gave them and needs them to know how to use in these last days. They came equipped for this, for this world. And it's it's tough as parents to see our kids have to live in such a sin-sick world. But we have to rely on our faith and we have to turn our children back to the Savior and we have to rely on Him completely so that we know the best ways to raise our children, the best things they need to hear, the things that we need to say, the things that we need to do to teach them and give them the chances so that they can fulfill the measure of their creation and do all the things that they promised Heavenly Father that they would do before they came here. So Lehi says to Joseph, And now, blessed art thou, Joseph, behold, thou art little. Wherefore, hearken unto the words of thy brother Nephi, and it shall be done unto thee, even according to the words which I have spoken. Remember the words of thy dying father. Amen. One of the words that we hear a lot, especially in this chapter we just read, is the Lord, mercy. And one definition for it that I, that I love, that really resonated with me, is especially active compassion. To stoop in kindness to an inferior. Somebody who is merciful is somebody who is in a higher position and stoops in kindness to an inferior beneath them. And another thought along those same lines, the Hebrew word for mercy means womb. So think about that. The most sacred thing that a woman can do is to grow a life inside her body. I have been so blessed to do that five times, seven times, but we lost two of them. But I love that the Hebrew word for mercy is womb. Because on my end, I feel like that is the most merciful gift that the Lord has given to women, that he even allows us to be co-creators with him and to bring these lives into the world and these precious angel 
perfect little souls that have waited for so long to be here and chose you as their mom and their dad and wanted to be with you. And think about that. The Hebrew word for mercy means womb. It's merciful for the Lord to allow us as women and fathers to be able to have these babies. And it's also merciful for us to allow these babies to use our bodies to develop and to grow and to be protected in the most sacred, incredible way that the Lord designed. I am so grateful that I get to be a mother. It is the greatest gift and I know not everybody gets that gift. But I know that you will. If you're righteous and obedient, no blessings will be reserved from us. The Lord will give us everything that he has and more. And that's a promise. Chapter 4. Lehi counsels and blesses his posterity. He dies and is buried. Nephi glories in the goodness of God. Nephi puts his trust in the Lord forever about 588 to 570 BC. And now I, Nephi, speak concerning the prophecies of which my father hath spoken, concerning Joseph, who was carried into Egypt. For behold, he truly prophesied concerning all his seed, and the prophecies which he wrote, there are not many greater. And he prophesied concerning us and our future generations, and they are written upon the plates of brass. Wherefore, after my father had made an end of speaking concerning the prophecies of Joseph, he called the children of Laman, his sons and his daughters, and said unto them, Behold, my sons and my daughters, who are the sons and the daughters of my firstborn, I would that ye should give ear unto my words. So now he's calling his grandkids, he's calling Laman's children, Laman's sons and daughters and kind of his grandkids. And he says, for the Lord God hath said that inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. And inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence. But behold, my sons and my daughters, I cannot go down to my grave, save I should leave a blessing upon you. So Lehi has called his grandchildren from Laman's side, who his heart has just got to be broken, because he's seen what happens to them, and he's seen... The, the path that they pick and the lives that they choose to lead and also the things that he's that they're told from their father and we know later that they believed in these foolish traditions of their fathers based off what Laman and Lemuel did and and the perspective that they had what they chose to believe about what actually happened it's a scary thing and it happens all the time in our day we have to be careful that our vision is not clouded by things that we're told that are not true. Christ is the great arbiter of truth. So it's up to us to go to him directly and ask him what is true. Ask Heavenly Father for the gift of discernment so that we can have that ability to understand what is true and what is error. So Lehi is leaving with his grandchildren, Laman's kids, a blessing. For behold, I know that if ye are brought up in the way ye should go, ye will not depart from it. So he's pleading with them, please hear the words that I'm going to tell you and please let this dictate your life. Because I know if you are brought up this way and you learn truth, you won't depart from it. Wherefore, if ye are cursed, behold, I leave my blessing upon you, that the cursing may be taken from you and be answered upon the heads of your parents. Wherefore, because of my blessing, the Lord God will not suffer that ye shall perish. Wherefore, ye, he will be merciful unto you and unto your seed forever. And it came to pass that after my father had made an end of speaking to the sons and daughters of Laman, he caused the sons and daughters of Lemuel to be brought before him. So now he wants Lemuel's children to come. And he spake unto them, saying, Behold, my sons and my daughters, who are the sons and the daughters of my second son, behold, I leave unto you the same blessing which I left unto the sons and daughters of Laman. Wherefore, ye shall not utterly be destroyed, but in the end thy seed shall be blessed. So he knows they're going to go through this whole cycle of a long time of wickedness, but in the end they actually do come back and become righteous. 
So I think he's trying to hold on to that promise that he's seen the Lamanites become righteous and then blossom as a rose in the Americas, which are the Native Americans are descendants of these Lamanites that we're talking about. And it came to pass that when my father had made an end of speaking unto them, behold, he spake unto the sons of Ishmael, yea, and even all his household. And after he had made an end of speaking unto them, he spake unto Sam, saying, Blessed art thou and thy seed, for thou shalt inherit the land like unto thy brother Nephi, and thy seed shall be numbered with his seed, and thou shalt be even like unto thy brother, and thy seed like unto his seed, and thou shalt be blessed in all thy days. And it came to pass that after my father Lehi had spoken unto all his household, according to the feelings of his heart, and the spirit of the Lord which was in him, he waxed old. And it came to pass that he died and was buried. So he told them, I only have a few days left and you got to listen to me. So he talked to each of his children. And now he talked to Laman's children and Lemuel's children. But according to this, we don't know if he got to speak with all of his grandchildren or if it was just those two family lines. So Lehi waxed old and died and was buried. And it came to pass that not many days after his death, Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael were angry with me because of the admonitions of the Lord. So Nephi's like, everything my dad told my brothers, it was like not many days after he died, they were mad at me again because of the things that he was telling them to do that the Lord told him to say. For I, Nephi, was constrained to speak unto them according to his word. For I had spoken many things unto them, and also my father. He saying his dad had spoken unto them too. Before his death, many of which sayings are written upon mine other plates. For a more history part are written upon mine other plates. And upon these I write the things of my soul. And many of the scriptures which are engraven upon the plates of brass. For my soul delighteth in the scriptures, and my heart pondereth them, and writeth them for the learning and profit of my children. My soul delighteth in the scriptures too. And I think that many of you here feel the same way, or else you wouldn't be here listening. Behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord, and my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. Nevertheless, notwithstanding with the great goodness of the Lord in showing me his great and marvelous works, my heart exclaimeth, O oh, wretched man that I am. Yea, my heart sorroweth because of my flesh. My soul grieveth because of mine iniquities. The humility that Nephi shows us here is so inspiring. He has lived such an incredible life. He has praised the Lord as he's tied up on a ship. From his brothers he has praised the lord when they when his bow broke he praises the lord and says you know what i know you're going to help me figure this out praise you and they offer sacrifices and praise the lord and here nephi the, the more he understands who the lord is the more he comes to him and sees his weaknesses but the more that he also sees his ability to overcome those weaknesses because of the savior so he sees himself now because of the great goodness of the Lord and exclaims, O oh, wretched man that I am. And his heart is sorrowing because of his flesh. So he hates that, he's, that he has to be mortal right now. He's like, I'm still a natural man. I still have temptations. I still have trials and afflictions. And I still have these things telling me that I'm immortal. These reminders that I am a mortal man. And he says, my soul grieveth because of mine iniquities. He's not saying my soul grieveth because I've had hardships. He's saying my soul grieveth because I've ever sinned. That's our goal, to get to that place where we feel that same way. Because the more that we acknowledge that we are a fallen, broken people, the more that we can put everything on our Savior, our confidence, our abilities, our drive, our passions, everything. He is our partner in everything. Nephi continues, I am encompassed about because of the temptations and the sins which do so easily beset me. 
He's like, I'm so easily tempted and I don't want to be anymore. And when I desire to rejoice, my heart groaneth because of my sins. Nevertheless, I know in whom I have trusted. So his, his natural man is trying to take over his joy right now. And he's saying, even when I feel like I am just so grateful and I just want to rejoice, I have in the back of my head, but you're not perfect. But you sinned this day and you made this bad choice this day and you did this. But he's saying, nevertheless, like, you know what? Even though I keep having that happen to me, I know in whom I have trusted. I know that I trust the Savior. He says, my God hath been my support. He hath led me through mine afflictions in the wilderness, and he hath preserved me upon the waters of the great deep. So he's remembering all the times that the Lord has been with him and saved him through the wilderness, through building the ship, going across the waters, not drowning, not having the boat sink in the storms. He hath filled me with his love, even unto the consuming of my flesh. He hath confounded mine enemies unto the causing of them to quake before me. Behold, he hath heard my cry by day, and he hath given me knowledge by visions in the night time. I love this so much because Nephi is showing us that in the midst of trials and afflictions, anxieties, stresses, we can feel this love and this light and this peace and this guidance that Nephi is feeling. In the midst of his affliction, he said, He hath heard my cries by day and given me knowledge by visions in the nighttime. Nephi knows who he trusts. Nephi, Nephi knows the source of his strength and the, source of it, and the source of his power. I love Nephi so much. I love his example. And by day have I waxed bold and mighty prayer before him. Yea, my voice have I sent up on high, and angels came down and ministered unto me. And upon the wings of his spirit hath my body been carried away upon exceedingly high mountains. And mine eyes have beheld great things, yea, even too great for man. Therefore I was bidden that I should not write them. Oh, then, if I have seen so great things, if the Lord in his condescension unto the children of men hath visited men in so much mercy, why should my heart weep, and my soul linger in the valley of sorrow, and my flesh waste away, and my strength slacken because of mine afflictions? We have to remember, his dad just died. And Nephi, you can see this, this inner turmoil of, he's, he's saying, I am so sad. My heart weeps, my soul lingers. But why do I feel like that? Because I have so many blessings and I have so many gifts and miracles. And I prayed and angels came down to me and ministered unto me. I've had protections. I've had times where the Lord saved my life, spared his life. And he says, the wings of the spirit hath carried his body into high mountains. So he has these visions, but he's still really sad. And I think he's telling us it's okay to feel both. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to feel that and still know that we're so grateful and still know that the Lord is with us and loves us. But it doesn't mean that life isn't hard sometimes. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to go through trials. Nephi says, and why should I yield to sin because of my flesh? Yea, why should I give way to temptations to the evil one that hath place in my heart to destroy my peace and afflict my soul? Why am I angry because of mine enemy? Awake my soul, no longer droop in sin. Rejoice, O my heart, and give place no more for the enemy, and give place no more for the enemy of my soul. Do not anger again because of mine enemies. Do not slacken my strength because of mine afflictions. So his dad had died. And then within a few days, his brothers are at him again, which means probably their wives and possibly their children. And there's a lot of them at this point. And then we have children of Ishmael that are there that would have been parents and had children also and had posterity there too. And Nephi is saying, I don't want to be angry at them. Why am I angry because of mine enemy? Why am I angry because of these people that are after me? And he even said he had spoken many things to them and he had stopped because he felt like the Lord was telling him, you got to stop. They're not going to listen. 
he had to cease speaking to them. Do not anger again because of mine enemies. Do not slacken my strength because of mine afflictions. Rejoice, O oh my heart, and cry unto the Lord and say, O oh Lord, I will praise thee forever. Yea, my soul will rejoice in thee, my God, and the rock of my salvation. O oh Lord, wilt thou redeem my soul? Wilt thou deliver me out of the hands of mine enemies? Wilt thou make me that I may shake at the appearance of sin? I love that. What a prayer. What a prayer that he so badly does not want to sin. He does not want to commit sin that he's asking the Lord, can you cause me to shake at the appearance of it? I don't want to go into the depths of dark. I don't want to, I don't want to live in that place. I want to stand in holy places and shake at the appearance of sin. May the gates of hell be shut continually before me because that my heart is broken and my spirit is contrite. A broken heart and a contrite spirit. O oh Lord, wilt thou not shut the gates of thy righteousness before me, that I may walk in the path of the low valley, that I may be strict in the plain road? O oh Lord, wilt thou encircle me around in the robe of thy righteousness? O oh Lord, wilt thou make a way for mine escape before mine enemies? Wilt thou make my path straight before me? Wilt thou not place a stumbling block in my way? But that thou wouldst clear my way before me, and hedge not up my way, but the ways of mine enemy. O oh Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. I will put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. Yea, cursed is he that putteth his trust in man, or maketh flesh his arm. So he's saying, O oh Lord, I trust in you. I don't trust in the arm of flesh. I know no man is infallible. Only Heavenly Father in Jesus can we put our trust in completely. Yea, I know that God will give liberally to him that asketh. Yea, my God will give me if I will ask not amiss. Therefore, I will lift up my voice unto thee. Yea, I will cry unto thee, my God, and the rock of my righteousness. Behold, my voice shall forever ascend up unto thee, my rock and mine everlasting God. Amen. Chapter 5 the Nephites separate themselves from the Lamanites, keep the law of Moses, and build the temple. Because of their unbelief, the Lamanites are cut off from the presence of the Lord, are cursed, and become a scourge unto the Nephites. About 588 to 559 BC. So we're covering basically 30 years here in this next chapter. So a lot is going to happen. Behold, it came to pass that I, Nephi, did cry much unto the Lord my God because of the anger of my brethren. But behold, their anger did increase against me insomuch that they did seek to take away my life. Again, right? They have tried so many different times to kill Nephi and have that desire in their heart. Yea, they did murmur against me, saying, Our younger brother thinks to rule over us, and we have had much trial because of him. Wherefore, now let us slay him that we may not be afflicted more because of his words. For behold, we will not have him to be our ruler, for it belongs unto us, who are the elder brethren, to rule over this people. So they're mad that Nephi Eve is even in charge at all. They don't want him to be in charge. They don't, they don't like that their dad put Nephi in charge, which actually means that the Lord put Nephi in charge. And they want to kill him. They don't want him to rule over them at all. Now I do not write upon these plates all the words which they murmured against me, but it sufficeth me to say that they did seek to take away my life. I remember when I was little, I was I'm I have three older sisters and two younger siblings. And I remember I had a notebook. And I, anytime we would fight, which we actually didn't fight that often, we're all really close now too, which is such a blessing. And when we were little, anything that anybody would say to me that was mean, I would grab my pen and go write it in my notebook. And I just remember feeling like they're going to be in so much trouble when mom and dad see all the mean things that they said to me. But I think about this with Nephi here. He says, I do not write all the mean things that they've said to me. But you know what? It suffices me to say, like, it's enough to say that they wanted to kill me. I think that's very spiritually mature and compassionate of Nephi 
not to write all the mean things about him because it'd be easy to do that and this is not this is not just a sibling rivalry this is so much bigger they want to kill him and they would they they hated him they were so angry at him and it came to pass that the lord did warn me that i nephi should depart from them and flee into the wilderness and all those who would go with me so the lord told him you gotta go you can't stay because they really do want to kill you and they probably would have had he stayed wherefore it came to pass that i nephi did take my family and also zoram and remember what lehi told us about zoram that he was a forever friend to nephi so he did take his family and zoram and his family and sam my elder brother and his family and jacob and joseph my younger brethren and also my sisters so we talked about nephi having sisters we don't know how many we know it was at least two because it's plural but i would love to meet them and hear their stories one day especially if they're choosing to go with nephi we know that they were righteous and that they were they were choosing the path that the lord was telling them to choose and all those who would go with me were those who believed in the warnings and the revelations of god wherefore they did hearken unto my words and we did take our tents and whatsoever things were possible for us and a journey in the wilderness for the space of many days and after we had journeyed for the space of many days we did pitch our tents and my people would that we should call the name of the place nephi wherefore we did call it nephi and all those who were with me did take upon them to call themselves the people of nephi and we did observe to keep the judgments and the statutes and the commandments of the lord in all things according to the law of moses and the lord was with us so they noticed the hand of the lord with them and we did prosper exceedingly for we did sow seed and did reap again in abundance and we began to raise flocks and herds and animals of every kind and i nephi had also brought the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass and also the ball or compass which was prepared for my father by the hand of the lord according to that which is written so the ball or compass another name for that is the liahona and it came to pass that we began to prosper exceedingly and to multiply in the land and i nephi did take the sword of laban and after the manner of it did make many swords lest by any means the people who were now called lamanites should come upon us and destroy us for i knew their hatred towards me and my children and those who were called my people so nephi is saying he also made swords and he modeled them after laban's sword that he had taken from laban and he said he had to do that because he knew how badly his brothers hated them so they're now called the Lamanites. And he knew that they were probably going to come and try to destroy him. And I did teach my people to build buildings and to work in all manner of wood and of iron and of copper and of brass and of steel and of gold and of silver and of precious ores, which were in great abundance. And I, Nephi, did build a temple. I love it. It's just a line. And I built the temple, by the way. <laughs> I built a boat, I built the temple. It's because he gives everything to the Lord. He gives all credit to the Lord always. So I, Nephi, did build the temple, and I did construct it after the manner of the temple of Solomon, save that were not built of so many precious things, for they were not to be found upon the land. Wherefore, it could not be built like unto Solomon's temple. But the manner of the construction was like unto the temple of Solomon, and the workmanship thereof was exceedingly fine. I love verses like this because it kind of shows a little bit of he's chiseling this into these plates. It would not be easy to go back and correct something. And he's like, I build a temple just like Solomon's. And he's like, well, okay, well, not as many precious things because we couldn't find them. And I guess it wasn't just like Solomon's, but it was after the manner of Solomon's. It's just... You can just see him like, oh, well, I don't know. I should, I didn't do it exactly like Solomon's. I just love when you can see personalities and see how they explain things. Like, oh, actually, what I meant to say was this, but I said this. There's a few of them in the Book of Mormon, and I love it. It's very, it's very human, and it's very endearing. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did cause my people to be industrious and to labor with their hands. And it came to pass that they would that I should be their king. 
but I, Nephi, was desirous that they should have no kink. Nevertheless, I did for them according to that which was in my power. And behold, the words of the Lord had been fulfilled unto my brethren, which he spake concerning them, that I should be their ruler and their teacher. Wherefore, I had been their ruler and their teacher, according to the commandments of the Lord, until the time that they sought to take away my life. Wherefore, the word of the Lord was fulfilled, which he spake unto me, saying that, Inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence. And he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. So in the second video, we talk about the cursing. And it says that they were exceedingly white. And this is the curse. This is why I was saying it has nothing to do with skin color. It has everything to do with your countenance and your closeness with God. Because it says they were cut off from the presence of the Lord and had a sore cursing placed upon them. So that's how we know. I think the verse about the whiteness has been misconstrued and taken out of context. But we know that white is the color of purity. And like I said in that video, and I will reiterate, I know many people, and we're reading about many people, who were the most incredible, sacred, close to the Savior people, who were not white. And that curse has nothing to do with skin color, and everything to do, like it says right here in verse 20, Inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence. And the next verse, 21, says, And that was the cursing that came upon them. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. So please see the separation. The blackness was not the curse. The skin of blackness here is showing that the Lord separated the people. And he made them look different from each other so that they didn't mix because that would have been an inner faith. It's not inner race, it's interfaith. The footnote right here says marriage, inner faith. And so because the Lamanites had been so wicked, the Lord did not want them mixing with the Nephites at this point. And thus saith the Lord God, I will cause that they shall be loathsome unto my people, say they shall repent of their iniquities. And cursed shall be the seed of him that mixeth with their seed, for they shall be cursed even with the same cursing. And the Lord spake it, and it was done. Remember verse 21 says the curse was being cut off from the presence of the Lord. And because of their cursing which was upon them, they did become an idle people, full of mischief and subtlety, and did seek in the wilderness for beasts of prey. And the Lord God said unto me, They shall be a scourge unto thy seed, to stir them up in remembrance of me, and inasmuch as they will not remember me and hearken unto my words, they shall scourge them even unto destruction. I like that because the Lord is saying he uses these trials and these afflictions to stir us up into remembrance of him. So he's like, they're going to be a scourge unto you to help you remember me. So that's that's the spirit of gratitude that Nephi lives in, is he's constantly giving gratitude and praise to the Lord and the Lord is telling him the same thing this verse verse 25 is also a foreshadowing of what will eventually happen we know and if you don't know you'll find out but but the entire Nephite civilization is destroyed at the end of this book they fall into iniquity and it's really really sorrowful what happens to them the Lord is giving a foreshadowing promise here where he says, basically, he's allowing the Lamanites to be a scourge unto the Nephites to help them remember the Lord. And if they don't, they will be a scourge unto destruction, even unto destruction. So the Lord is saying, they're going to make your lives hard, but they're going to help you remember me. And if you don't, your posterity will be destroyed. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did consecrate Jacob and Joseph, that they should be priests and teachers over the land of my people. And it came to pass that we lived after the manner of happiness. Again, Nephi is positive and grateful and talking about happiness. 
we lived after the manner of happiness, and thirty years had passed away from the time we left Jerusalem. And I Nephi had kept the records upon my plates which I had made of my people thus far. And it came to pass that the Lord God said unto me, Make other plates, and thou shalt engrave in many things upon them which are good in my sight, for the profit of thy people. Wherefore I, Nephi, to be obedient to the commandments of the Lord, went and made these plates upon which I have engraven these things. And I have engraved that you and I have engraved that which is pleasing unto God, and if my people are pleased with the things of God, they will be pleased with mine engravings which are upon these plates. And if my people desire to know the more particular part of the history of my people, they must search mine other plates. For it sufficeth me to say that forty years had passed away, and we had already had wars and contentions with our brethren. Chapter 6 Jacob Recounts Jewish History The Babylonian Captivity and Return The Ministry and Crucifixion of the Holy One of Israel The Help Received from the Gentiles And the Jews' Latter-day Restoration when they believe in the Messiah About 559 to 545 B.C. The words of Jacob, the brother of Nephi, which he spake unto the people of Nephi. Behold, my beloved brethren, I, Jacob, having been called of God, and ordained after the manner of his holy order, and having been consecrated by my brother Nephi, unto whom ye look as a king or a protector, and on whom ye depend for safety, behold, ye know that I have spoken unto you exceedingly many things. So that's cool too. So Jacob is saying, Guys, you know I've told you a ton of things. And I, I wish we knew what he said. I wish we had record of those those writings of what Jacob had told them before this point. This is the first time that we're hearing from Jacob himself. Nevertheless, I speak unto you again, for I am desirous for the welfare of your souls. Yea, mine anxiety is great for you, and, and ye yourselves know that it ever has been. For I have exhorted you with all diligence, and I have taught you the words of my Father. And I have spoken unto you concerning all things which are written from the creation of the world. And now, behold, I would speak unto you concerning these things which are, and which are to come. Wherefore, I will read you the words of Isaiah, and they are the words which my brother had desired, that I should speak unto you. And I speak unto you for your sakes, that ye may learn and glorify the name of your God. And now the words which I shall read are they which Isaiah spake concerning all the house of Israel. Wherefore they may be likened unto you, for ye are the house of Israel. And there are many things which have been spoken by Isaiah, which may be likened unto you, because ye are of the house of Israel. And now these are the words, and now these are the words, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their faces towards the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. Thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. We want to be the people that are waiting for the Lord. I am waiting for the Lord. And I... And now I, Jacob, would speak somewhat concerning these words. For behold, the Lord has shown me that those who were at Jerusalem from whence we came have been slain and carried away captive. So he's again telling them, you guys, just to let you know, remember how we left Jerusalem? Jacob is telling them, I have seen it. The Lord has shown me that Jerusalem is destroyed now too. Nevertheless, the Lord has shown unto me that they should return again. And he also has shown me that the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, should manifest himself unto them in the flesh. And after he should manifest himself, they should scourge him and crucify him according to the words of the angel who spake it unto me. And after they have hardened their hearts and stiffened their necks against the Holy One of Israel, behold, the judgments of the Holy One of Israel shall come upon them. And the day cometh that they shall be smitten and afflicted, Wherefore, after they are driven to and fro, for thus saith the angel, many shall be afflicted in the flesh, and shall not be suffered to perish because of the prayers of the faithful. They shall be scattered and smitten and hated. Nevertheless, the Lord will be merciful unto them, that when they shall come to the knowledge of their Redeemer, they shall be gathered together again to the lands of their inheritance. 
they're talking about the gathering, the literal gathering, the gathering of Israel and the restoration of Israel. And behold, are the Gentiles they of whom the prophet had written? For behold, if it so be that they shall repent and fight not against Zion and do not unite themselves to that great and abominable church, they shall be saved. For the Lord God will fulfill his commandments, which he has made unto his children. And for this cause, the prophet has written these things. Wherefore, they that fight against Zion and the covenant people of the Lord shall lick up the dust of their feet, and the people of the Lord shall not be ashamed. For the people of the Lord are they who wait for him, for they still wait for the coming of the Messiah. And behold, according to the words of the prophet, the Messiah will set himself again the second time to recover them. Second coming. Wherefore, he will manifest himself unto them in power and great glory, unto the destruction of their enemies, when the day cometh, when they shall believe in him, when they shall believe in him, and none shall he destroy that believe in him. That's a pretty powerful promise. And none shall he destroy that believe in him. And they that believe not in him shall be destroyed, both by fire and by tempest, and by earthquakes and by bloodsheds, and by pestilence and by famine. And they shall know that the Lord is God, the Holy One of Israel. For shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? For thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. The prey of the terrible shall be delivered. That is such a powerful promise for all of these incredible, that is such, that is such a powerful and necessary no, that is such a powerful and comforting promise for all of those children caught up with this human trafficking. We know this is worldwide. It's in the Book of Mormon. It's prophesied in the last days that all the wickedness will be rampant on the earth and these secret combinations. And the Lord tells us here, the prey of the terrible shall be delivered, even the captives of the mighty. So everybody just thinking that Christ is going to come and deliver all all of us and all of these children and any person who is struggling or who is a prey or a captive of any person or any scenario or any condition, anything, the Lord will come and save all of us. And I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Chapter 7 Jacob continues reading from Isaiah. Isaiah speaks messianically. That means like the Messiah. Like the Messiah. The Savior will have the tongue of the learned. He will give his back to the smiters. He will not be confounded. Compared to Isaiah 50, about 559 to 545 BC. The first 13 verses of chapter 7, Nephi actually gives us a whole bunch of keys to help us understand Isaiah, because it can be a little bit confusing. So listen for some of these keys that he says to use to understand Isaiah. Yea, for thus saith the Lord, Have I put thee away, or have I cast thee off forever? For thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? To whom have I put thee away? Or to which of my creditors have I sold you? Yea, to whom have I sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, there was no man. When I called, yea, there was none to answer. O house of Israel, is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make their rivers a wilderness, and their fish to sink because the waters are dried up, and they die because of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season unto thee, O house of Israel. When ye are weary, he waketh morning by morning. 
He waketh mine ear to ear as the learned. The God, the Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiter, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. And the Lord is near, and he justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near me, and I will smite him with the strength of my mouth. For the Lord God will help me. And all they who shall condemn me, behold, as they shall wax old as a garment, and the moth shall eat them up. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, and obeyeth the voice of the servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Behold, all ye that kindle fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks which ye have kindled. This shall ye have of mine hand, ye shall lie down in sorrow. Chapter 8 Jacob continues reading from Isaiah. In the last days the Lord will comfort Zion and gather Israel. The redeemed will come to Zion amid great joy. Compare Isaiah 51 and 52 verses 1 through 2, about 559 to 545 BC. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness. Look unto the rock from whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit from whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah, she that bare you, for I called him alone and blessed him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, and thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light for the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that shall dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart I have written my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men. Neither be ye afraid of their revilings. So don't worry about anything that man can do to you. Only care about what the Lord wants you to do. Know that the Lord is always more powerful than anything any, any man could do to any of us. For a moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days. Art thou not he that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art thou not he who hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy and holiness shall be upon their heads. And they shall obtain gladness and joy. Sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I am he, yea, I am he that comforteth you. Behold, who art thou, that thou shouldst be afraid of man who shall die, and of the son of man who shall be made like unto grass? And forgettest the Lord thy maker, that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, and hast feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy? And where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hasteneth, that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. Behold, I am the Lord thy God, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is my name. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens, and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Behold, thou art my people. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling wrung out. 
and none to guide her among all the sons she hath brought forth, neither that have taken her by the hand of all the sons she hath brought up. These two sons are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Thy desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword. And by whom shall I comfort thee? The sons have fainted, save these two. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken and not with wine. Thus saith thy Lord, the Lord and thy God pleaded the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling and the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee. Who thou said to thy soul, Bow down, that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground, and as the street to them that went over. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Chapter 9 Jacob explains that the Jews will be gathered in all their lands of promise. The atonement ransoms man from the fall. The bodies of the dead will come forth from the grave and their spirits from hell and from paradise. They will be judged. The atonement saves from death, hell, the devil, and endless torment. The righteous are to be saved in the kingdom of God. Penalties for sins are set forth. The Holy One of Israel is the keeper of the gate about 559 to 545 BC. And now, my beloved brethren, I have read these things that ye might know concerning the covenants of the Lord, that he has covenanted with all the house of Israel, that he has spoken unto the Jews by the mouth of his holy prophets, even from the beginning down from generation to generation until the time comes that they shall be restored to the true church and fold of God when they shall be gathered home to the lands of their inheritance and shall be established in all their lands of promise. Behold, my beloved brethren, I speak unto you these things, that ye may rejoice and lift up your heads forever because of the blessings which the Lord God shall bestow upon your children. For I know that ye have searched much, many of you, to know of things to come. Wherefore, I know that ye know that our flesh must waste away and die, Nevertheless, in our bodies, we shall see God. So I love this. So Jacob is still speaking and he's saying, guys, I just read to you the words of Isaiah. And the reason is because I wanted you to see all the covenants that the Lord has given to the house of Israel. And Jacob says, these are covenants and blessings that the Lord has promised us from the beginning of time, from generation to generation. All the holy prophets have spoken of this. And then he says, and I know that you've been wanting to know what's going to happen. I mean, if you want to know if this book is written for our day today, this is exactly how me and so many of us feel. We want to know what's going to come soon. We want to know about these last days prophecies. We want to know especially about the covenant blessings that the Lord has given to the house of Israel. And our prophet, President Nelson, has asked us specifically to study those covenants that the Lord has given to the house of Israel. Yea, I know that ye know that in the body ye shall show himself unto those at Jerusalem from whence we came, for it is expedient that it should be among them. For it behooveth the great creator that he suffereth himself to become subject unto man in the flesh and die for all men, that all men might become subject unto him. So we're talking again about the condescension of our Savior. He suffered himself, so he allowed himself to become subject unto man, so to even have a mortal experience and be like us. For as death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great creator, there must needs be a power of resurrection, and the resurrection must needs come unto man by reason of the fall, and the fall came by reason of transgression, and because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. Wherefore, it must needs be an infinite atonement. Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. Infinite means it covers everything. Everything that we could possibly do, think, feel, experience. Um, our Savior has suffered. 
our Savior has condescended down to the earth to experience those things for us and with us so that we can be partners with him in everything that we do. Seva should be an infinite atonement. This corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgment which came upon man must needs have remained to an endless duration. And if so, this flesh must have laid down to rot and to crumble to its mother earth to rise no more. Oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy and grace. For behold, if the flesh should rise no more, our spirits must become subject to that angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God and became the devil to rise no more. So he's saying, how great and merciful and gracious is our God because this is our only chance. Jesus Christ is our only chance back. Our only chance. Had he not come and atoned for us and done what he did for us with an infinite atonement, we would be subjects to Satan. We would be eternally cut off from the presence of the Lord because none of us because none of us can do it on our own. None of us can make it back to Heavenly Father without Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And our spirits must have become like unto him. And we become devils, angels to a devil, to be shut out from the presence of our God. And to remain with the father of lies and misery like unto himself. Yea, to that being who beguiled our first parents, who transformeth himself nigh unto an angel of light. And stirreth up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder and all manner of secret works of darkness. That is our world right now. We have secret combinations running nearly every branch of government, almost every industry. This has been a very meticulously calculated plan that Satan has done over and over and over. And at the core of it is our agency. So he's doing all he can to trap us, to put us in snares, it says in the Book of Mormon, and take away our agency so that we become subjects to be acted upon instead of subjects or people to act like we just read about. Now here comes the hope. Jacob told us what, what our future would hold had Christ not come and suffered for us. And now here's the hope. Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth the way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also death of the spirit. So the atonement had to cover this awful two-headed monster. And I love that he calls it an awful monster because it is. That's exactly what it is that wants our utter destruction. And he says, because of Jesus Christ, he destroys that monster. The, the atonement covered everything and takes all power away from this awful monster, death and hell, because he allows us a path back to him, back to repentance. Repentance just means to turn, to turn back to God. And I, when I was thinking about this concept, you know, there's Sometimes we're told things like, all you have to do is proclaim the name of Jesus and you're saved. And I don't feel like that's how it works because in a relationship, if I tell my husband, I love you, but then I lie to him and cheat and steal and commit all manner of abominations or treat him awful. Do you think it's going to be a good relationship? Do you think we're going to feel that partnership? Whereas if, if I say, I love you, I choose you, and then I honor him, and I'm honest to him, and I commune with him, we communicate, and we spend time together, and honor that sacred covenant that we have, which one feels like the right path? I've lived in the South, and I don't mean to... Um, belittle or discredit any other religion but faith without works is dead and we do have works that we need to do because we have chosen the Savior and now we show him now we show him how we chose him it is all about the relationship when we have a relationship with our Savior 
We no longer have these checklist items of things that we need to check off. It becomes a partnership and a relationship where we choose the things that we do because we love our Savior. And that's it. It's not it's not rules and regulations and lines. It's covenant keeping and it's love and it's honor and respect and obedience because we love our Savior and because we know he loves us. So we want to do what he's asked us to do. We want to be obedient to him. And because of the way of deliverance of our God, the Holy One of Israel, this death of which I have spoken, which is the temporal, shall deliver up its dead, which death is the grave. And this death of which I have spoken, which is the spiritual death, shall deliver up its dead, which spiritual death is hell. So which is worse, right? Our physical death is a grave. Spiritual death is hell. Wherefore, death and hell must deliver up their dead. And hell must deliver up its captive spirits, and the grave must deliver up its captive bodies. And the bodies and the spirits of men will be restored one to another. And it is by the power of the resurrection of the Holy One of Israel. So remember, Jacob is speaking to us right now. And Jacob and Joseph never knew their parents to have money. They never knew affluence. They never knew, they never knew financial prosperity. They've lived their entire lives in tents, in the wilderness and listen to Jacob. He gets it. Jacob is young and yet he is preaching one of the most powerful sermons on the plan of salvation of anywhere in the scriptures. And he basically says, if it were not for Christ, we would all go to hell with the awful monster, death and hell. But the plan of salvation is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the plan of salvation. Oh, how great the plan of our God. For on the other hand, the paradise of God must deliver up the spirits of the righteous, and the grave deliver up the body of the righteous, and the spirit of the body is restored to itself again, and all men become incorruptible and immortal, and they are living souls, having a perfect knowledge like unto us in the flesh, save it be that our knowledge shall be perfect." Wherefore, we shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt and our uncleanness and our nakedness, and the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment and their righteousness, being clothed with purity, yea, even with the robe of righteousness. So he's saying, whether we chose wickedness or righteousness, we will have a perfect recollection of all of our choices and the way they affected other people, the way they affected us, And it shall come to pass that when all men shall have passed from this first death into life, insomuch that they have become immortal, they must appear before the judgment seat of the Holy One of Israel, and then cometh the judgment, and then must they be judged according to the holy judgment of God. And assuredly, as the Lord liveth, for the Lord God hath spoken it, and it is his eternal word which cannot pass away, that they who are righteous shall be righteous still. And they who are filthy shall be filthy still. Wherefore, they who are filthy are the devils and his angels. And they shall go away into everlasting fire, prepared for them. And their torment is as a lake of fire and brimstone, whose flame ascendeth up forever and ever and has no end. So who we are on earth is who we will be after we die. It's the same. If we do works of the Lord... And we're righteous, we will still be righteous. It says, and those who are filthy shall be filthy still. So it's not like we can put off our repentance and put off our turning back to the Lord. This is the time. And when we die, we are the same person that we were while we were alive. Oh, the greatness and the justice of our God. For he executeth all his words, and they have gone forth out of his mouth, and his law must be fulfilled. But behold, the righteous, the saints of the Holy One of Israel, they who have believed in the Holy One of Israel, they who have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it, they shall inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and their joy shall be full forever. Let's be on that team, okay? Let's pick that side. Oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God, the Holy One of Israel, for he delivereth his saints from that awful monster, the devil, and death, and hell, and that lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. Oh, how great the holiness of our God, for he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. And he cometh into the world, that he may save all men, if they will hearken unto his voice. 
For behold, he suffered the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. It's hard for me not to focus on this plague of human trafficking, and I know I brought it up before, but the fact that the Savior has suffered every every pain possible for men, women, and children is so comforting to know that he can reach them and he can help them and he can save them. And every child that's in any type of abusive or painful situation, Christ has already suffered for those sins and also for the sins of the people who are inflicting that pain. His mercy knows no bounds. You guys, we have the greatest savior. We just have to get to know him because he knows you. Oh, how great the holiness of our God. For he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. And he cometh into the world that he may save all men if they will hearken unto his voice. For behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children who belong to the family of Adam. And he suffereth this, that the resurrection might pass upon all men, that all might stand before him at the great and judgment day. And he commandeth all men that they must repent and be baptized in his name, having perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel, or they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. So repent, be baptized in his name, and then have perfect faith in him. That's what we need to do. And when we have that perfect faith, that means that we live our lives differently. Faith allows us to live a completely different life. We don't live in fear. We don't live in worry about all the this could happen or that might happen or what if this happens. We live in faith. And our faith says, if that happens, then we'll be okay. If that happens, Heavenly Father will help us through it. If that happens, Jesus already knows. He's already suffered it for us. We can do it. We can do these hard things. And if they will not repent and believe in his name and be baptized in his name and endure to the end, they must be damned. For the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has spoken it. Wherefore, he has given a law, and where there is no law given, there is no punishment. And where there is no punishment, there is no condemnation. And where there is no condemnation, the mercies of the Holy One of Israel have claim upon them. And where there is no condemnation, the mercies of the Holy One of Israel have claim upon them because of the atonement, for they are delivered by the power of him. For the atonement satisfieth the demands of his justice upon all those who have not the law given to them, that they are delivered from that awful monster, death and hell, and the devil and the lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment, and they are restored to that God who gave them breath, which is the Holy One of Israel. But woe unto him that has the law given, yea, that has all the commandments of God like unto us, and that transgresseth them, and that wasteth the days of his probation, for awful is his state. O oh, that cunning plan of the evil one! O oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men! When they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. But to be learned is good, if they hearken unto the counsels of God. So he's saying, it's good to know, it's good to have a lot of education and do a lot of study and academic work, but only if we hearken unto the counsels of God. All truth comes from Heavenly Father, all of it. And so if we understand that and we learn everything under that lens that all truth comes from the Lord, then we're okay. Then it's good. Yes, learn. Educate yourself. Learn all sorts of things. But don't ever think that you know more than God because you have education. We have to be cautious that we don't become prideful the more that we learn and the more that we know. And if we understand that God is the arbiter of all truth and that all truth comes from Him and also the Holy Ghost testifies of all truth, no matter what subject or area of study it is, then we're okay. He says, but to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. 
But woe unto the rich, who are rich as to the things of the world. For because they are rich, they despise the poor, and they persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their treasures. Wherefore their treasure is their God. And behold, their treasure shall perish with them also. So that's a good caution, a good warning. He's not saying it's bad to have money. He's saying whatever our heart is set upon is our God. If our heart is set upon money, money, making money, doing everything you can to make money, then that will become your God. If our heart is set upon God and upon our Savior, then everything added to us can be a blessing, not only for our families, but for everybody else that we feel prompted to to give and to share. And woe unto the deaf that will not hear, for they shall perish. Woe unto the blind that will not see, for they shall perish also. So this is interesting because the way he words both of those, the deaf that will not hear. Will is an action. Will is something that you choose to do or not do. It doesn't say that can't hear. It says the deaf that will not hear. There's our agency. There's our action. We are commanded to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And right now he's saying that the people who choose not to hear are deaf. And the ones who choose not to see are blind and they will both perish. It has nothing to do with our actual physical sight and our actual physical hearing. It is all about hearing the word of the Lord and seeing his hand. Woe unto the uncircumcised of heart, for a knowledge of their iniquity shall smite them at the last day. Woe unto the liar, for he shall be thrust down to hell. Woe unto the murderer who shall deliberately killeth, for he shall die. Woe unto them who commit whoredoms, for they shall be thrust down to hell. Yea, woe unto those that worship idols, for the devil of all devils delighteth in them. And in fine, woe unto all those who die in their sins, for they shall return to God and behold his face and remain in their sins. O my beloved brethren, remember the awfulness in transgressing against the holy God and also the awfulness of yielding to the enticings of that cunning one. Remember, to be carnally minded is death. Carnal is like your natural man desires, like whatever you want to do. Carnal is like um, desires of the appetite. Those are carnal desires. So he says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life eternal. Spiritually, S. Minded, M. Is, I. Life, L, eternal, E, smile. That's what that spells. And I remember when I was in seminary, people would always say, oh, that's the smile scripture. That's the smile scripture. So we'd all write smile. If you remember with the lines, you know, the three lines, the three lines, you cross them over and connect them. Anyway, that's the smile scripture. Remember to be carnally minded is death and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. O oh, my beloved brethren, give ear to my words. Remember the greatness of the Holy One of Israel. Do not say that I have spoken hard things against you. For if ye do, ye will revile against the truth. For I have spoken the words of your Maker. I know that the words of truth are hard against all uncleanness. But the righteous fear them not. For they love the truth and are not shaken. I love that he talks about not being shaken by the words of the prophets and the words of the scriptures. It all comes down to our humility and knowing that, like he says, I know that the words of truth are hard against all uncleanness. We are all unclean. None of us are perfect. And so he's acknowledging, I know what I'm saying might be hard to hear, but the righteous people don't fear my words, but they love truth and they're not shaken. Just because we don't want to hear something doesn't mean that it's not truth. Truth always confounds us. Truth always sanctifies us. And he says that the righteous fear not these words, for they love truth and are not shaken. That's the side we want to be on. Oh, then, my beloved brethren, come unto the Lord, the Holy One. Remember that his paths are righteous. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. So he's saying Jesus Christ himself is the one at the gate. He doesn't have somebody else take over that role because he's the one that knows us. And it's 
our job our whole lives to get to know him and to know his voice to know his character to know his spirit and to know the way he feels about us so the holy one of israel is the keeper of the gate and he employeth no servant there and there is none other way save it be by the gate for he cannot be deceived for the lord god is his name and whoso knocketh to him will he open and the wise and the learned and they that are rich who are puffed up because of their learning and their wisdom and their riches yea they are they whom he despises and save they shall cast these things away and consider themselves fools before god and come down in the depths of humility he will not open unto them but the things of the wise and the prudent shall be hid from them forever yea that happiness which is prepared for the saints O oh, my beloved brethren, remember my words. Behold, I take off my garments and I shake them before you. I pray the God of my salvation that he view me with his all-searching eye. Wherefore, he shall know at the last day when all men shall be judged of their works that the God of Israel did witness that I shook your iniquities from my soul and that I stand with brightness before him and am rid of your blood. O oh, my beloved brethren, turn away from your sins. Shake off the chains of him that would bind you fast. Come unto that God who is the rock of your salvation. Prepare your souls for that glorious day when justice shall be administered unto the righteous, even the day of judgment, that ye may not shrink with awful fear, that ye may not remember your awful guilt in perfectness, and be constrained to exclaim, Holy, holy are thy judgments, O Lord God Almighty. But I know my guilt. I transgressed thy law, and my transgressions are mine, and the devil hath obtained me, but I am prey to his awful misery. But behold, my brethren, is it expedient that I should awake you to an awful reality of these things? Would I harrow up your souls if your minds were pure? Would I be plain unto you according to the plainness of the truth if ye were freed from sin? Behold, if ye were holy, I would speak unto you of holiness. But as ye are not holy, and ye look upon me as a teacher, it must needs be expedient that I teach you the consequences of sin. Behold, my soul abhorreth sin, and my heart delighteth in righteousness, and I will praise the holy name of my God. Come, my brethren, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore, do not spend money for that which is of no worth, nor your labor for that which cannot satisfy. Hearken diligently unto me, and remember the words which I have spoken, and come unto the Holy One of Israel, and feast upon that which perisheth not, neither can be corrupted, and let your soul delight in fatness. He's trying to show this has nothing to do with how much money you have or earning the ability to know the Savior. He's like, just come. Just come and don't let Satan be the one to capture you. And he says, I don't want you to face the Lord on Judgment Day and have to see all these transgressions and know that you are guilty of all of those because you never repented. You never turned back to the Lord. And he says, if you were more pure, I could speak to you as if you were pure, but you're not. And you need to hear these things. And this is the same thing, once again, written for us, for our day. And he's speaking this to all of us. It's expedient that I teach you the consequences of sin. There are consequences that are very real consequences of sin. And I love when he says, my soul abhorreth sin. Like, I, I hate it. I can't even think of accepting it as anything that would be okay for me in my life. And he says, I will praise the name of my God. And he's telling everybody, come and come be with us. Everybody that's thirsty and has no money, come by and eat. Because it has nothing to do with money. It's all about our hearts. That's the price we pay is our hearts and our humility and our obedience. Hearken diligently unto me and remember the words which I have spoken and come unto the Holy One of Israel and feast upon that which perisheth not and neither can be corrupted, lest your soul delight in fatness. Behold, my beloved brethren, remember the words of your God. Pray unto him continually by day, and give thanks unto his holy name by night. Let your hearts rejoice. There is so much power, especially healing power, in gratitude. And we talked about this 
all these hardships that Nephi went through with his family, he's constantly offering sacrifices, burnt sacrifices unto the Lord as gratitude, constantly. And it's usually the first thing that he does. There is healing power in gratitude. It has the power to literally heal your wounds, your cells, your souls. And I have experienced that in my own life. And that is true. I know that that is true. Okay, I will tell you this story. It's a very sacred experience for me, but this project is very sacred too. And if you're here, I trust that you're here because you want an increase of the spirit in your life. So I will tell you one of my many miracles. So after my last baby was born, she's now, she'll be three pretty soon. Right after my last baby was born in 2020, as I was sitting in the hospital, my blood pressure dipped to 50 over 30 a couple times. And I was not doing well and I passed out a few times and gratefully my mom and my husband were there and my baby had already been born and she was beautiful and perfect and we had so many miracles just around that pregnancy and that birth. But I, um, we didn't know my blood pressure kept dipping and it turned out I had a missed uterine rupture but every time that I would contract, her, her little back would block that rupture. So I didn't lose any blood. My blood pressure was fine during the delivery because she was blocking that, that rupture in my uterine wall, <laughs> which that alone is such a miracle and preserved mine and her life. But after I had her, I didn't bleed hardly at all, like nothing. And the doctors and the nurses were concerned. And then my blood pressure kept dipping and they did an ultrasound and could see a tennis ball sized clot on my, on my right ovary. And the, uh, the doctor came in and said, we have to operate right away because that we can't have you clotting right now. That means that you're internally bleeding. And it turned into a really scary situation really fast. And I remember they wheeled me down to go into surgery. And my nurse, who had been helping me, this had been like four hours after I'd had my baby. And she'd been pushing on my stomach so hard to get me to bleed. And I wouldn't bleed. And they were so concerned. This was before they found that clot. And I remember she grabbed my face in her hands like this and just said, You will live you're going to live, you're going to, you're going to survive this, you will live. And that's when it hit me like, could I not live? What's happening? And I just had this kind of euphoria of I just had this baby and she's here and she's beautiful. And, and we had complications with my pregnancy and I had to meet with the uh, neonatologist the whole, the whole pregnancy weekly. And so I was just so grateful to have her here and have the delivery and they ended up calling five more surgeons into that surgery. And I had, by the time they got into my stomach, he could see that that tennis ball clot had grown to the size of a cantaloupe. And I was bleeding into my back, which is really scary because when blood pools around organs, it kills the organs. And so he was the doctor was telling me that he, they were just frantically trying to suction out this blood, get the blood away from my organs, but it meant that I lost five liters of blood, which five liters is as much as any adult has in their entire body is five liters. But when you're pregnant, you can have up to eight liters. So that was a miracle for me that I had more blood than just an average human adult. I ended up having four blood transfusions and they had to, by the time they got back, to my other organs when they were trying to get the blood away from my vital organs in the back, the blood had pooled around other vital organs for me and, and had killed those organs. So I had to have a lot of things taken out of my body. And the, I am so many emotions. I, first off, I am so grateful that I survived this. While I was in the ICU with my husband, I wasn't allowed to see my baby. And gratefully, my mom was there at the hospital and they let her stay upstairs in the mother baby and she got to have my baby for a whole day. And I remember seeing in the ICU, it's just a glass door and then there's a curtain. So you can see feet standing outside your door. 
and I could see there was a doctor standing right outside my door and I could only see him from the knees down. And he stood by my door for about 30 seconds, just standing there. And I thought, I thought it might have been this one doctor that had delivered my other babies that, that we were really close with. And he finally came in about 30 seconds later and was really emotional. And I, I knew that he was trying to gather um, his emotions to come in. I just could feel that. And he came in and he said, we just, we just had a, a brief, we just had a meeting talking about your surgery and your situation. He said, we counted 26 ways that you should have died. And he said, there's no other reason that you're here except the Lord needs you here. That's it. He said, people have had even one or two of the things that you went through and not survived. And he went through way more than I understood. I'm not a doctor and I, didn't ha I don't have a medical mind. But it was a really scary and sacred experience for me. And I was in so much pain too and I remember just sitting in the hospital bed and just thinking I can't move I can't hardly breathe I can't I can't even hardly lift my arms and I have this little baby and I can't even see her and I'm dying to see her and hold her and be with her and I thought I'm my body is helpless right now but my mind is not helpless and I would just close my eyes and just envision Heavenly Father's literal hands coming into my body and healing me cell by cell, correcting every single thing, helping my body to heal, to compensate for things that I'm lacking, to um, repair itself and to be able to allow my own body to fulfill the measure of what the Lord needs me to do. And I kept thinking he saved me for a reason and I am just so grateful. And I just envisioned him healing and I just felt so much gratitude that I have a heavenly father and I know that and that he built me. And I thought he created me. If he created me, he knows how to heal me more than anything else. And he did. And I, I could just see his hands just working in my body. And I just, the gratitude was overwhelming for me. And I can't even tell you how many doctors have told me how miraculous it was, how quickly I recovered from this. To have four blood transfusions and lose that much blood takes months and months and months of healing, let alone losing the organs that they took out and, and then healing from the surgery and the incisions and the scars and all those things. And I know Heavenly Father helped me so much and I've learned that it was because of gratitude that the Lord was able to heal me. Gratitude is literally healing. It rewires our brain and it starts a healing process in us. So when Jacob says, Behold my beloved brethren, remember the words of your God. Pray unto him continually by day and give thanks unto his holy name by night. Let your hearts rejoice. I testify to you that gratitude will change your life and your children's lives. If your children are having a hard time, just have them say five things they're grateful for and get in this habit where it rewires their brain instead of feeling victimized or um, wanting to complain or be upset about something. All of a sudden it changes their mind so now they see things in gratitude. They live in a spirit of gratitude. And now how great the covenants of the Lord and how great his condescensions unto the children of men and because of his greatness and his grace and mercy, he has promised unto us that our seed shall not utterly be destroyed according to the flesh, but that he would preserve them and in future generations they shall become a righteous branch unto the house of Israel. The baby that I just talked about, we actually named her Grace. And it was because I felt so much that she was an absolute gift that we didn't earn. And that's what grace is. The Lord gave me grace in granting my life, not because of anything that I did, but just because He is our Lord and our Savior, and He knows the end from the beginning, and He knows that I need to still be here, 
And so that is why our little girl Grace is just the perfect name for her. And also what she overcame in utero. Oh, how great the plan of our God. And now, my brethren, I would speak unto you more, but on the morrow I will declare unto you the remainder of my words. Amen. Chapter 10 Jacob explains that the Jews will crucify their God. They will be scattered until they begin to believe in Him. America will be a land of liberty where no king will rule. Reconcile yourselves to God and gain salvation through His grace. About 559 to 545 B.C. And now I, Jacob, speak unto you again, my beloved brethren, concerning this righteous branch of which I have spoken. For behold, the promises which we have obtained are promises unto us according to the flesh. Wherefore, as it has been shown unto me that many of our children shall perish in the flesh because of unbelief, nevertheless God will be merciful unto many, and our children shall be restored, that they may come to that which will give them the true knowledge of their Redeemer. Wherefore, as I said unto you, it must needs be expedient that Christ, for in the last night the angel spake unto me that this should be his name, shall come among the Jews, among those who are the more wicked part of the world, and they shall crucify him, for thus it behooveth our God, and there is none other nation on earth that will crucify their God. That is such a sobering thought. There's none other nation on earth that would crucify their God. And I love that Jacob tells us an angel told them the name of the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, all the other names that they've used for our Savior. Now, he says, the angel told me his name would be Christ. For should the mighty miracles be wrought among other nations, they would repent and know that he be their God. But because of priestcrafts and iniquities, they at Jerusalem will stiffen their necks against him that he be crucified. Wherefore, because of their iniquities, destructions, famines, pestilences, and bloodshed shall come upon them, and they who shall not be destroyed shall be scattered among all nations. But behold, thus saith the Lord God, when the day cometh that they shall believe in me, that I am Christ, then have I covenanted with their fathers that they should be restored in the flesh upon the earth and unto the hands of their inheritance." And it shall come to pass that they shall be gathered in from their long dispersion, from the isles of the sea, and from the four parts of the earth, and the nations of the Gentiles shall be great in the eyes of me, saith God, in carrying them forth to the lands of their inheritance. Yea, the kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them, and their queens shall become nursing mothers. Wherefore the promises of the Lord are great unto the Gentiles, for he hath spoken it, and who can dispute? But behold, this land, said God, shall be a land of thine inheritance, and the Gentiles shall be blessed upon the land. And this land shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and there shall be no kings upon the land, who shall raise up unto the Gentiles. And I will fortify this land against all other nations. And he that fighteth against Zion shall perish, saith God. For he that raiseth up a king against me shall perish, for I, the Lord, the King of heaven, will be their king. And I will be a light unto them forever that hear my words. And I will be a light unto them forever that hear my words. Wherefore, for this cause that my covenants may be fulfilled, which I have made unto the children of men, that I will do unto them while they are in the flesh, I must needs destroy the secret works of darkness and of murders and of abominations. So he's saying that our role while we are in the flesh, so while we have our bodies, while we're on the earth, is to destroy the secret works of darkness and murders and abominations. If you don't dare speak out against this evil that's running rampant in our world, please read this verse in verse 15. That is literally our role while we are in the flesh, while we are living on the earth, is to destroy the secret works of darkness and of murders and of abominations. Wherefore, he that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, both male and female, shall perish. For they are they who are the whore of all the earth. Remember, we kept reading about the whore of all the earth, the great and abominable church. And, and I said that the 1830 edition of the dictionary showed that that meant group of people. And it 
shows that here. He says, anybody, male or female, who are fighting against the Lord are part of that great whore of all the earth, the great and abominable church. For they who are not for me are against me, saith our God. For I will fulfill my promises which I have made unto the children of men, that I will do unto them while they are in the flesh. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, thus saith our God, I will afflict thy seed by the hand of the Gentiles. Nevertheless, I will soften the hearts of the Gentiles, that they shall be like unto a father to them. Wherefore, the Gentiles shall be blessed and numbered among the house of Israel. This next verse is all about freedom of religion, the whole purpose of the United States of America. Wherefore, I will consecrate this land unto thy seed, and them who shall be numbered among thy seed forever for the land of their inheritance. For it is a choice land, saith God unto me, above all other lands. Wherefore, I will have all men that dwell thereon, that they shall worship me, saith God. And now, my beloved brethren, seeing that our merciful God has given us so great knowledge concerning these things, let us remember him and lay aside our sins and not hang down our heads, for we are not cast off. Nevertheless, we have been driven out of the land of our inheritance, for we have been led to a better land, for the Lord has made the sea our path, and we are upon an isle of the sea. But great are the promises of the Lord unto them who are upon the isles of the sea. Wherefore, as it says isles, there must needs be more than this, for they are inhabited also by our brethren. For behold, the Lord God has led away from time to time from the house of Israel according to his will and pleasure. And now behold, the Lord remembereth all them who have been broken off. Wherefore, he remembereth us also. Therefore, cheer up your hearts and remember that ye are free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. Reconcile means um, kind of like get rid of your differences, which means repent. It's just another way of saying repent. Repent to the will of God. Like change our natural man and the things that we want to fight against, the things that we naturally want to do, if they're carnal, if they're just based on appetites of the flesh or appetites of, uh, if they're just based on appetites of the flesh, Jacob is telling us, reconcile yourselves, like change, turn back to the will of God. Wherefore, my God raise you from death by the power of the resurrection and also from everlasting death by the power of the atonement, that ye may be received unto the eternal kingdom of God, that ye may praise him through grace divine. Amen.